but for now it's my great pleasure to invite uh, the, this webinar's last uh, speaker, uh, and it's Dr. Joel Passmeyer from the um, uh, who's scientific uh, chief scientific officer at the Vaccine Project Management and presenting on a completely new vaccine for all of us, the VPM uh, 1002 vaccine, uh, which is a tuberculosis vaccine, but has now been taken into use for a potential other uh, outcome. Dr. Uh, Pashmir, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me well and you can see my presentation. Um, since I hear no objections, I will start. So thanks for the organization and the invitation and the possibility uh, to present to you our uh, trial with VPM 1002 um, in the COVID indication uh, for uh, the sake of uh, declaration of conflict of interest. VPM 1002 is um, licensed by Serum Institute of India and also developed by Serum Institute of India. And Serum Institute of India is also our main shareholder. Um, but without further ado, I would like to go into my presentation and explain you a little bit first about what is VPM 102. So VPM 102 was invented by Stefan Kaufmann and Leander Krode at the Max Planck Institute for Infection Biology in the early 2000s. The idea was basically to take uh, the classical BCG, but genetically modify it to make it, first of all, safer but also maybe more efficacious by having a more tailored and more specific immune response. So to this end, listeriolysin uh, from listeria monocytogenes was introduced into the bacterium while simultaneously deleting urea C. And what then happens is that listeriolysin forms pores in the phagozones zones and allows antigens to translocate into the cytosol of the host cell. Uh, this in turn allows for different um, signaling pathways and other features of the host cell to be better activated. For once, a rather obvious uh, uh, feature for immunologists is, of course, the better CD8 positive T cell activation by having the antigens in the cytosol. But uh, Stefan Kaufmann uh, remained busy, and over the years, he also um, investigated further pathways that are uh, significantly involved, and that is, for example, the inflammasome activation leading to uh, pronounced uh, inflammation responses. The cells undergo uh, much more apoptosis, uh, which leads to more cross priming, but also has beneficial effects on the safety of the product uh, since persistence is reduced. And also autophagy plays a significant role uh, and uh, seems to induce type 1 interferon responses. So taking all of this together, uh, uh, there was the assumption that VPM 102 would be a, a, a potentially safer and um, a more efficacious product. So uh, it all started at the Max Planck Institute. And in 2004, my company licensed it in, uh, including the co-inventor Leander Grode, who is now our CEO. Um, we then started with establishing a fully EU GMP compliant state of the art uh, GMP manufacturing process, uh, did the necessary non clinical work, and in 2008, uh, we already conducted the first in human trial in, the, uh, in, in, in Germany in healthy adults, always with the goal, first, of course, uh, the TB prime indication. That was always our first goal. Uh, what next followed was a, a phase 1b trial in South Africa, uh, always with the goal TB in our head. So that's why we wanted to go as quickly as possible to endemic countries. Then followed the phase 2a trial, uh, first entering our target population, mainly uh, or, or namely uh, newborn children. Um, and we've conducted successfully a phase 2 trial in South Africa and I will talk about that a little bit more, but very shortly. So this trial, this phase two trial uh, was completed in 2017, has recently been accepted by Lancet Infectious Diseases. Um, uh, we could show in that trial that uh, um, the safety seems actually much better for VPN 1002, especially when it comes to reactionicity. Um, local reactions were clearly reduced. And when it comes to very preliminary efficacy results in the, in the quantiferon 
tests in both groups, we at least see very similar results, but this trial was not intended to demonstrate efficacy. Therefore, we started uh, in 2020, a phase three trial all over, over, all over Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, to be precise in five Sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, our first dosing happened in 2022. And this multi-center phase three trial has the aim to demonstrate that DPM-1002 is at least as efficacious as standard BCG. So this trial is recruiting very well. We expect it to finish within the next one or two months. And then the follow-up starts and we hope we get results soon. Then some of you might also know, and it was already topic today rather quickly that BCG is also used in uh, the treatment of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. We also investigated VPN 1002 in this setting. Here it's called VPN 1002 BC. Uh, uh, we went here into the second line indication, so the recurrent non-muscle invasive bladder cancer patients that already had bladder cancer, had BCG treatment, unfortunately had a recurrence, and then would usually uh, uh, be targeted for cystectomy. We gave them another chance with our product. And usually in this second line indication, conventional BCG only achieves a recurrence-free survival rate after 60 weeks of 12.5%. Our target was to get 30%. Uh, we consider that as clinically meaningful. And we were quite happy to achieve actually 49.3% recurrence-free rate after 60 weeks. And uh, just recently we got our three years data, follow-up data back. And what makes us really happy is that we basically seem to have achieved a plateau because we're still at 43.7%. Uh, the treatment is considered very safe and rather uh, very tolerable, especially in this challenging setting. 95% um, of all the patients finish the induction phase. So these are repeated installations of the product. But we are talking today more about another indication and that's where I'm heading now. Um, when the COVID pandemic hit all of us in, 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 yeah, in the first quarter of 2020, um, we were also thinking about, okay, um, what can we do? And, and Stefan Kaufmann put us into contact with Mia Netia, who basically told us about the trial. He was, uh, he was spearheading in, 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 in the Netherlands. So we thought we should also do that. And together with, uh, with Mia and Netia, we basically uh, took his idea as a starting point and developed our own protocol in this indication. And what resulted basically was our trial. So it was a phase three trial, randomized double blind placebo controlled multi-center trial. In Germany, we had 12 centers. Um, we recruited 20, uh, two, uh, roughly over 2000 subjects in the elderly population. So 60 years and above, randomized them one-to-one. -one, so VPN 102 versus placebo and followed them up for roughly eight month or 240 days. So that was the whole general idea that we had. We went to our regulators, the Pauli Ehrlich Institute. We have a very long standing relationship with them and proposed this to them. And they had some uh, requirements for us. The first one, and so this was, we, we, we designed the study in March, basically March, April and approached the pie end of March. And they, they got back to us with one basic requirement. Nobody knows how this uh, pandemic will actually uh, develop. So they, they limited us to one visit for the, uh, for the participants at the site, which was basically the time of vaccination. So we could do no blood drawings with very restricted monitoring capabilities. So we switched everything to uh, remote monitoring. Um, and uh, all the follow-up, was done remotely with a specially designed validated web app uh, in which uh, the trial participants could enter everything that we needed to assess. Um, what also happened, and I think everybody who did these trials knows this, um, we have started the dosing basically in beginning of June and then nothing happened. Uh, the, the pandemic basically died down a little bit until October, it took up 
uh, but we had not we had not very many uh, uh, incidences or events during that phase. Uh, our recruitment picked up in December when the next wave started in Germany. Um, but um, then the next thing happened, and that was um, that the, vac the, the specific vac uh, vaccination started. So, and uh, like in most countries, uh, the first people to receive the vaccinations were, of course, the elderly population. And uh, they were very quickly uh, vaccinated in Germany, which uh, led to the for the participants, of course, uh, a great uh, fact, but for us for in the trial, a little bit more challenging, uh, a rate of 70% of our uh, participants were then specifically vaccinated. So this was all a little bit challenging and also a little bit challenging for our assumptions that we made in the beginning. Yeah, so the weekends. So in summary, uh, we see a significant reduction of days with fever in the VPM 102 arm. Uh, we see 40% reduction of days with severe respiratory disease. However, this did not achieve significance. The treatment was safe and well tolerated and all the safety results were in line with what, what we have seen in our previous trials in adults and newborns, uh, very tolerable and safe. And of course, unfortunately, the high vaccination rate and the low um, incidence rate, yeah, made it a little bit challenging for us to get more readouts out of this. But we're still evaluating the data and hope to come back with a little bit more insight into this. I wanna thank here in the end, our collaborators, so especially Serum Institute of India, Umeshali Graman Hicharma, um, Christoph Schindler, who was our coordinating investigator uh, or overarching the, the German trial sites, Paul Stefan Kaufmann, who, um, basically gave us the idea and the connection to Mihai Netea, who was basically our starting point for the whole project and the protocol that we used. And with that, I also wanna thank the whole team of VPM. Um, everybody was very involved in the trial and it kept, kept us quite busy during the pandemic, which was good because then we uh, all didn't have time to read the news that much. And with that, I would like to end. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was fascinating, Gerald, and, uh, and completely new information to most of us. And thank you also for sharing so generously these uh, preliminary results. And again, a reminder to, to all of the audience that we've had uh, so many people here presenting results that haven't been published at all uh, until now, and, and thus uh, respect uh, the privacy here. There is a question here from uh, Frank Shan asking how many participants had previous BCG and how many had a BCG scar. Could you help us address that? Yeah, um, we didn't assess it specifically, but given the situation in Germany, um, almost all of the elderly population have received BCG previously because uh, it was mandatory in Germany to have BCG vaccination up until in Western Germany, I think up until, in, uh, until the, the 70s and in Eastern Germany up until basically the early 90s. Uh, so we assume that all of them were pre-exposed to BCG. So you didn't assess their BCG scar? We did not, not specifically assess the scar, no. Thank you very much. I think we are just exactly on uh, time here with this uh, presentation and with our schedule. We have now an hour set aside for uh, for uh, a panel discussion. Uh, I just wondered if I saw a hand from you, Eva, would you have a, a specific question here uh, to this presentation? Yeah, I, I just have one small question. So was there any possibility to get uh, data on self antigen testing of, of those participants? Um, well, we had them uh, reporting their self-antigen testing in the web diary. Um, the data itself, we do not, we did not get. Yeah, we only uh, were informed when they had a positive test, and that that was basically our read. But not how often they actually tested, or that they would test like no. every week. Thank you. 
So before the panel discussion, uh, at least the group I'm with here in Copenhagen suggests we have just a very brief three minutes uh, bio break before we return to the panel discussion. So I will propose that. Hope you will stay uh, on, on this meeting and join us for, for what I think will be a great panel discussion uh, afterwards, which will be headed by uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Sepra Klein. Uh, so I will I'll leave the floor from here to, to just be a part of the panel while Sabra will uh, moderate it. Uh, but for now, just a short bio break. <laughs> 